We collectively, and that includes students and parents and teachers, we are not naturally good learning engineers. Just like we are not naturally good at diagnosing and treating our own medical issues. We know that, well I'm hoping we know, that grandma's you know, remedies aren't the cure-all for everything. We need to get access to evidence-based medicine, etc. What's interesting is this kind of result is something we really want teachers and students and parents to understand and actually embrace at that level that you just described. Hi, I'm Sridhar Rajagopalan, co-founder of Education Initiatives Private Limited, one of India's leading edtech and assessment research organizations. Our mission in EI is to use cutting-edge pedagogical research and technological methods to ensure that children everywhere are learning with understanding. EI Dialogues is a platform that brings together educational leaders to explore ideas that can transform the educational landscape in India and beyond. Today I have the privilege of speaking to Dr. Brauer Saxberg. Uh, Dr. Saxberg is an expert in learning engineering. He has uh, been the founder of Learning Forge LLC and earlier was the chief learning officer at Kaplan Inc. and also headed the learning research work at Chan Zuckerberg Initiatives. Brauer earlier worked with McKinsey and has degrees in mathematics, electrical engineering from MIT and an MD from Harvard Medical School. In our conversation today, I'm really curious to know about learning engineering and the research from learning sciences, about the science of motivation, the importance of practice, and where talent comes from, and how we can use these learnings to make education better for everyone. In India, the wish of parents is that uh, every son should be an engineer or a doctor, preferably from a top institute. Now, you are an electrical engineer from MIT and an MD from Harvard Medical School. Is that even possible? How did you manage that? <laughs> well, you know, I couldn't make up my mind. No, what, what really happened is uh, uh, I got interested in how the brain stores and processes information when I was in uh, college as an undergraduate. I actually did research at the Jet Propulsion Laboratories in Pasadena on that. And so weirdly, I was a rocket scientist at one stage. And I, I was really interested in the overlap between how you know, brains function and all of that, um, but also in you know, kind of the, the underpinnings and the connections to information processing and things like that. So I really wanted to combine these things together into kind of a, a, a research work. And so, uh, began down that path. And uh, I, you know, I, I guess in retrospect, it, it was a little ambitious to try to do all of that at once, but it seemed to hang together. Um, the, the other uh, odd story about all this is, um, I didn't realize at the time when I applied to MIT that, um, that there was a possibility of being able to also go to Harvard Medical School. I had been admitted to Harvard Medical School and I was at the time uh, studying in Oxford in the UK, and I looked at a map and I saw that, hey, wait a minute, Cambridge and Boston are close. I'm an electrical engineer as well. I wonder if I could get in and do something interesting you know, between the two. And so I shipped off an application, and amazingly enough, I got admitted. And not just admitted, they actually offered me funding. So now it was no longer, hey, I wonder what would happen. It was actually quite serious. So I called the director of admissions and I said, this is great, I really appreciate what you've done here, and of course offering the funding is, an amazing, is amazing. However, there was no box on the application form that said, are you planning to simultaneously attend another higher education institution while completing your PhD? So there wasn't any place to say, I'm also already admitted to Harvard Medical School. So I said to the director of admissions to MIT, you guys look like you're close on the map, can I do these two things at the same time? And he just laughed. And he said, there's a bus. 
And I said, there's a bus? And he said, yeah, it starts at Harvard Medical School, stops in front of MIT, keeps going to Harvard Upper Campus, which is also in Cambridge, and we run it together, Harvard and MIT. It goes back and forth all day long. And I said, so no bus, no MD-PhD? But with a bus, you can do an MD-PhD? And he said, you got it. So that was one of my first experiences of better learning through logistics, you see. So uh, that, it is possible to do. You need a few unique circumstances to allow it, however. Oh, fascinating. I mean, that sounds like interesting learning engineering to me. So, I mean, we've known you as, you know, this expert on learning engineering, and it's, we've had a number of interesting conversations. For our audience, can you tell us what is learning engineering? People have started hearing about learning sciences. Uh, how are they different? And why is this such an important and a fascinating topic, especially in education? Sure. So the, the language still hasn't fully gelled. So people are using these terms somewhat differently from each other. But the way I think about it is the difference between a science discipline and an engineering discipline. So for example, chemical engineering is not the same as chemistry. The last person you want building your pharmaceutical factory is a chemist because they have no interest in the economics of what they're doing or regulations, safety. They don't want to figure out how to store a million gallons of hydrofluoric acid. That's just not what a chemist is interested in. But a chemical engineer, in addition to being very interested in chemistry and using all the modern chemistry, is also trained and engaged by the practical circumstances of uh, health and economics and all that, and also recognizes your first try at something at scale may not work. And so part of what all engineers do is get ready to iterate. They, they take their best first shot, and then they want to measure to see how we're doing, and then they keep iterating. So that metaphor of chemist, chemical engineer, I would argue is, should be the same in our learning and training world. It just hasn't turned out that way. So there are now quite a lot of really deep, scientifically valid results about uh, human learning in general, uh, about uh, specific domains of learning like math or writing or STEM or other things, um, around motivation, what gets people to start persistent put in mental effort. So there's a lot of science over the last set of decades that's built up, but what's less often done is to try to apply those scientific results at scale in coherent environments for learning. So to me, that's the difference, is that the learning sciences about, uh, you know, like chemistry or even biological sciences, what's the deep nature of things, and how do we get as much accuracy as we can over that deep nature? The engineering side is, how can we use the science to solve real-world problems? And so, to me, there are many kinds of learning engineering problems, and therefore learning engineers. So, I can easily think of teachers as actually being learning engineers. They have real world problems of motivation and skills and backgrounds, and they're trying to solve them in real time uh, you know, in their classrooms. It would be great if they actually had an underpinning of learning science results to help them with the individuals that are in front of them. So to me, learning engineering and learning sciences are both kind of quite broad, but then very different. One is more focused on iteration, trying again, checking if all the learners you hope to help are being helped, making a change if you need to. That's an engineering approach and mindset. And the sciences are then trying to more deeply understand what is going on with learning? How do minds actually work? How do brains actually help or hinder uh, learning? So that's how I see the difference between those two. Suppose I'm a teacher. Is there something that uh, I can learn from you know, some results uh, from learning sciences and from learning engineering that I could apply in my, in my class. So if you could talk a bit about these kinds of uh, points. Maybe I'll start with uh, motivation because that issue of how do you get a student who's not motivated to become motivated? And so one of the things that some of the science work around motivation has done is to first create, I think, a clear definition of what we mean by motivation. Right. And so a clear definition is uh, will a student start, persist, and put in mental effort? So that's, that's kind of a, a clear definition. And you'll notice liking what they're doing isn't part of that definition. And it's, it's quite specifically excluded because just like in the case of physical exercise, 
if you exercise, if you use a well-designed physical exercise program, even if you hate it, but you complete it, your muscles will change. You will get stronger, right? You don't have to like that. Now, and why do people do that? Because they like what they're going to do with their strength or their new flexibility or whatever it is, but they don't have to like the work itself. And the same thing arguably is true about learning, which is if you are executing a well-designed program of learning, you may not like every part of it, but if you execute it well, your brain will change. It, all the practice and feedback will cause changes in the neurons and their connections and so forth. So that definition is important. What, you know, what gets in the way, let's say, of starting, persisting, and putting in mental effort? So a very good researcher, uh, Richard Clark, did an analysis of a whole range of research uh, areas, and he came up with a really uh, interesting and fairly simple four-part framework that I think could be very valuable as teachers look at students who are not starting, persisting, and putting in mental effort. And the first part of that is, do you, does the student value what they're doing and how they're doing it, right? So if I'm a dancer in an algebra class, I've got issues. I mean, I'd rather think about Swan Lake than this crazy thing with letters and numbers and formulas and all that. And so I'm not going to start, persist, and put in mental effort. I'd rather daydream about what I really love to do. So how do you handle that type of thing? Well, you, you, the teacher needs to figure out how to draw a link between what the dancer is really interested in in that case and how this could help them. So maybe a dance foundation. How would you fund that? How would you keep that alive? Well, that's actually interesting to dancers about because they're, they're working with foundations and, and companies and so forth. And so you can draw on their expertise and their interests to pull that forward. Another thing you can do is um, share stories of others who are just like them, who didn't think there was any reason to do it, who found their own reasons for doing it. And so now you create an analogy between them and the student, him or herself. Second thing that goes wrong is very different than the first thing, that um, you just think you can't do it. So another dancer in the same algebra class just has as a long-standing belief, I'm no good at math. So it does no good for the teacher to come up and talk about how important it is for future. And the, you just make the person miserable. I mean, it's getting, making things worse. Um, however, what you can do is try to show you've done things like this before. You know, your work at taking steps and getting started in dance is not that different than your, the work of getting started on some of these math things and so forth. Uh, the third thing, a third thing that goes wrong, is uh, you blame things in your environment. Uh, my teacher hates me. That I remember from my own fourth grader a decade or more ago. I was like, my teacher hates me. Now, why does that stop you from learning that your teacher hates you? It's your brain, but it just happens that way. You know, that's why I'm not going to do this. Um, uh, or, you know, I don't have space to work, or my technology doesn't work, or the one that's a favorite of professionals and students all across the globe, I don't have time, right? So, oh, it's important. Oh, I could do it, but I just don't have time. Not that I'm saying that's ever happened to you or to me, <clears throat> but that's a very common one. And again, the solution there is to work with the person to show, okay, if you don't have space, Let's look at where you walk and where you work and see if we can find space. If you don't have time, let's look at your schedule. If it's a business setting, let's talk to your manager. If it's a cool school setting, let's figure out after school or can we move some other subjects, give you the time that you need, um, and so forth. So that's about problem solving around the thing you blame in your environment for that. And the last thing that Richard Clark found, which is actually, I think, the hardest of these four things, is negative emotional states. If you are angry, if you are scared, um, if you are uh, uh, depressed, uh, and in this post-COVID world, if you're grieving, I mean, there's just there's a lot of negative things that are happening to people's emotions. It's just really hard to start, persist, and put in mental effort. So I walked through all that in part because, so now here's little Broer sitting in a teacher's class. Little Broer slumped over sideways, staring out the window, okay? He looks like a lump, okay? Well, yeah, but now we have some tools. What kind of lump is Little Broer, right? Is he a lump because he doesn't value what we're working on? Is he a lump because he thinks he can't do it? Is he a lump because he thinks something's in his way of being successful? Or is he just bummed out? And it could be more than one of those things, right? So now the teacher potentially has some tools as well as some ways to interact and engage um, based on the research that's actually been done. So I, I think that kind of thing is actually you know, uh, quite valuable. There's also some really interesting work, I think, around 
designing for cognition. So meaning, if a student is motivated to do work, how do you make sure the work really uh, optimizes students' progress? And so there, one of the key things that comes out of learning science's work is that what we have in our head divides up between things that are in long-term memory that stay in our minds for a long time, that are immediately accessible to us. We instantly recognize things. They may even be patterns and things we can just do without even thinking about it or not thinking about them much. And then we have working memory, which is where complex tasks happen, where uh, we try to uh, uh, understand new things, try to put together things in a new way. So it turns out that long-term memory appears to be free to working memory. So if you've already mastered something in long-term memory, it's instantly available in working memory to be a part of what you're doing. So one of the things, again, for teachers is if you're going to begin a new challenging activity, like we're going to start learning how to write a persuasive essay, you want to actually start that ideally with materials and context that are familiar and interesting to the students, because then that's free. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I imagine, uh, you know, here in India, for example, uh, uh, you know, kids would be cricket mad, right? So if you were writing a persuasive essay about putting in, uh, you know, an extension to the cricket pitch, right, the kids would know exactly why I want to do that. I'm so excited about that. I'm going to post this thing to my local government as soon as I get it done. Yeah, but now we have to write it persuasively, right? So the fact that you know a lot about cricket, great. You know why you want this, great. How do we make a persuasive argument for that audience? So now you have motivation, but you also have a bunch of free stuff. If instead that kid was given an essay about changing an American baseball stadium, it's like, I don't even know what that is. I don't even care about that. What is baseball, right? And now you've added a cognitive load. You've put something else new in working memory what is baseball? How, what do they even need? I have no idea. And that then takes away precious space from how do we write persuasively. So ideally, a teacher would be thinking about my class and what is motivating and already familiar to them before you get started on something brand new that's hard. And then as they get better at that, writing persuasively becomes part of their long-term memory now you can shift to using the writing persuasively skills for learning new areas and new things that are going on. Fascinating. I mean, uh, I think to all the teachers listening, the, the first example you gave of, of motivation where, you know, do they value it? Do they see themselves as capable or not capable of, of, of doing it? Is something coming in the way which they are externalizing the problem to probably? And uh, finally, emotionally, you know, are they kind of set? I think these are very practical tips that took a problem like motivation, which looks like this, you know, this vague thing out there, kind of systematically said, you know, check for these three or four things and probably tackle them uh, very differently. I think that's a fantastic uh, model or a fantastic toolkit that any teacher can use. So brought a slightly uh, different topic that I wanted to talk about because um, in our work at EI, both in the assessments and in the learning work, we base a lot of our work on what we call the science of learning. What we mean by the science of learning is actually going deep into how children learn specific concepts. So if I'm talking about mathematics, it could be polynomials, it could be fractions, it could be measurement. In science, it could be how do children understand photosynthesis, uh, work on misconceptions, you know, how do children learn to read. And then we have found that going deep into that helps both in assessing it well, giving the correct kind of diagnostics, and the same uh, the background work can help me teach children well. So something like MindSpark actually uses that to, uh, to say that, okay, if the child is having this kind of a learning gap, then provide this kind of uh, opportunities, and, and that seems to actually help. A number of studies have, have shown that. How do you feel this, do you see this as important, and how does this fit with what you are broadly describing as learning engineering? Yeah, so in, in, in my language, which I'm not claiming is the language <laughs> of everyone, um, that fits absolutely inside learning engineering, where the learning sciences results you're drawing from are domain specific. Mm -hmm. 
So they are, you know, how do we teach writing better? Um, how do we teach adding fractions with unlike denominators? And both of those are actually very hard for kids and are incredibly important for future progress for kids, right? And so there is research on that. And then, so how do we put that to work in the real world is part of what MindSpark actually does from an activity standpoint, as well as having really good uh, assessments to try to figure out, well, which thing is failing here in this and how does that all work? So to me, that, that, that domain-specific work, incredibly important, is part of learning engineering as a whole. At the same time, I would say, you know, you want to complete the puzzle. So what you don't want to do, and, and you are not doing this, so this is a total caricature, you don't want to take a really good result about uh, learning to write like structured writing habits really works and turn that into a lesson that's an hour-long lecture by a teacher on why structured writing is so great. Because now you're messing up another aspect of learning engineering, which is the need for practice and feedback, the need to activate that person's actual neurons and run them, right? So the idea is you need to combine, the, I would argue, the, 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 the pedagogical learning sciences, the, the, the domain specifics one, together with more general uh, frameworks of learning science around the design of the environments and ways to structure the activities and so forth so that you end up with something that works well for multiple reasons. It is both because you picked out good activities and good diagnostics from the, the, the pedagogy-specific uh, areas, but also you generally have designed this now in accordance with things that lower cognitive load and that just, you know, are, are, are designed to make sure the brain is actually working and getting enough practice and feedback. So that's how I see it. I see learning engineering as kind of a big tent and drawing on many different, you know, science disciplines. You know, another thing we do, Brar, which uh, is very interesting is that we try and identify students who are performing very well uh, in our asset test. There's a talent search exam and then some of these children go through a, a, a three-week program, uh, and, and these are the children for whom we run a gifted program. We used to do this with Duke University for a number of years. Now we do this uh, on our own. And one of the, the, the feelings we've always had is that the students who, everybody says that these kids are like exceptional, they seem to be gifted, but it seems to be more than that. It also seems to be the effort they are putting in. And does, does learning engineering and learning science talk about this, are there some uh, findings or takeaways there? So there's a really interesting result from Ken Kadinger at Carnegie Mellon University looking at uh, data from a, a range of US-based learning environments um, through DataShop, which is a large collection of uh, information from these different modules at different levels of students, many different kinds of subjects that they've been collecting for years. And they decided to go mine that data to look for the fastest learners. Right. The learners who, you know, you know, if you gave them learning exposures, that they just learned a lot more each time than other kids. And then, of course, you would study the fast learners to try to figure out what are they doing and can we teach all kids to do that. And the thing that shocked them, they were not expecting this, is, well, one thing they found that they knew was likely is Kids start at very different levels in America, and I'm sure that's true here, Absolutely. that the same classroom at the beginning, wow, some kids are almost there, and some kids are really far from mastery. So that was expected. The thing that was not expected is that the rate of learning improvement was the same for all the kids. Whether you started low or started high, each new well-designed, have to be clear, well-designed learning opportunity gave you the same increment of learning performance. Well, this is kind of... Counterintuitive. Yeah, mind-blowing, because we all think we know fast learners and yes. teachers are able, right? Now, a key thing here is these had to be well-designed learning environments, and they actually had a technical way to tell based on learning curves and things like that. So it was an empirically defined, well-designed learning environment. My hypothesis, because they're still trying to understand this as well, right? Because they did not expect this. They beat the data up all kinds of ways. It still seems to hold. My feeling is, if you're in a badly designed learning environment, some students have methods to learn in spite of the badness of the learning environment, and other students are just blocked by it. 
And that will look like different learning rates, just based on the skills of a student to overcome a bad learning environment. But what this seems to show is if you already have a well-designed learning environment, they're all just chunking along at the same rate. And th this has some surprising consequences that we don't think enough about, I think, in our learning world, and we should, because this is coming out of data. This is not aspirational or a design piece. This is actually from the data that, that Ken and his colleagues put together. One is the importance of well-designed learning environments, that that brings everybody into some parallel kind of nature, and that which is powerful. The second thing is it, it really highlights how important motivation is, because you may start low, your rate of learning is the same, but to get to the same high performance that everybody, that others get to, you just need more shots on You're goal. You've got to persist longer. You've got to persist longer and take more of them. Now, it's in a very regular, you can almost predict what you need, but you have to keep starting, persisting, and putting in the mental effort. And you know, he did one look, informal look, that he didn't publish uh, yet, um, at marginalized groups in the US. And what he found is, uh, starting at the same place, marginalized groups, they began moving up at the same rate, but they stopped earlier than white and Asian kids, right. starting from the same level. So they were all parallel together, and then one group just stopped. So that actually gets at the third thing, right, which is how do we structure learning so that all kids can get the number of well-designed learning opportunities they need to be successful? And so why did some of those kids stop early when they were on the same track? Well, it could be just things like, I'm no good at math, never have been, my family's no good at math, see, more evidence, I'm just gonna stop. So it could be a pure motivation problem. But especially for marginalized kids, um, kids from poverty, it could be that it's the structure of their world and their work doesn't let them have enough time. So if you say, we're making this unit done in this week, and here are the learning opportunities, right? Some kids, if they need 12 learning opportunities, they have the time to do it. Other kids working 40 hours a week or who knows what their home life is like and so forth cannot find the time to do 12, only get five or six in. Well, then they are, you can predict, you can see that they're not going to actually achieve that. So that turns this into a structural problem. And, and that's where you know, uh, tools and practices like what you guys are doing with MindSpark and other things it may be able to enable kids to have more practice, well-designed practice, than they might ordinarily in a regular classroom that's not augmented with some additional technology and actual support. Um, but that's, that's, that's just, to me, is just a really important example of how effort is so critical. Now, you know, if you look at genius level performance, there's probably some extra magic sprinkled on top, right? That's fine. But the evidence over decades shows that and this goes back to Anders Ericsson's work way back with the 10,000 hours of deliberate practice. And deliberate practice is another way of talking about well-designed learning, right? Deliberate practice. And again, it was much more about how much of that deliberate practice did you get rather than kind of beginning talent, something about where you were when you were six years old. It's like that has almost no predictive impact. What really has the impact is amount of practice and feedback that you're actually able to execute. We collectively, and that includes students and parents and teachers, we are not naturally good learning engineers. Right. Just like we are not naturally good at diagnosing and treating our own medical issues, right? We, we know that, well, I'm hoping we know that grandma's you know, remedies aren't the cure-all for everything. We need to get access to evidence-based medicine, et cetera. What's interesting is this kind of result is something we really want teachers and students and parents to understand and actually embrace at that level that, you've been that you just described around, huh, I actually can get there I just need enough practice and, and feedback opportunities, well designed, and I will get there, as opposed to either the teacher saying, don't worry about it, you're never gonna get there, don't worry about it, or myself or my family saying, with the best of intentions, none of us are any good at this either, don't worry, let it go, we'll, plenty of other things to do in the world. And, and here, what we're saying is, if we can change the storytelling around learning, 
to be connected to the learning sciences um, and have better learning engineering stories for everyone, th there is just a range of possibilities that could emerge from that that would be just powerful. The inevitable topic, AI and ChatGPT, uh, but critical in education, I think, frankly, all of us are a little confused. I don't think teachers or educators have the answer. Uh, we've seen, we, we, we know it's powerful, we've, we've used it. We also see that there are opportunities where it may be misused or children may just realize that, you know, let ChatGPT do all the work. How do you see this? How do you see generative AI influencing education? And are, again, are there any takeaways or suggestions or, or thoughts on this? Yeah, a couple of things. One is, so early in the explosive uh, uh, awareness of the current uh, world of generative AI, uh, back like seven months ago, which seems like forever in this world, um, I had ChatGPT3 write a bio of me. And I, you know, there's stuff about me on the web or whatever. So, and it did a great job. It really laid it out, five, six paragraphs, you know, beautifully constructed, firmly placed, convincing, except it said I got my PhD from Stanford. Now, I'm enough of an MIT guy to not think that's an upgrade, okay? I really did get my PhD from MIT, and that should, that should be in there, right? So this made me think, and again, you know, for your audience, don't know if they know this guy, there's a gentleman in the US named George Santos, who was a legislator in New York, who was elected, but lied about every, everything in his family background, where he worked. He claimed to have a knee injury from playing volleyball at a university. He never played volleyball. He never went to the university. I mean, it was a staggering display of just mendacity but firmly, positively presented, of course this is true. If you didn't do the digging, you would accept it as is. So to me, my bio plus that thing said to me, the model, a model is, hmm, imagine if you had George Santos as your assistant, okay? And you give your assistant a task, what are you gonna do? You're gonna check it. You know, you love the fact that it's produced well, it's cleanly written, it covers a lot of the ground, but you also know it may not get everything right, and it may not know that it's not getting everything right. So that's the first piece of caution about the, uh, the generative AI. The second thing I'd say is it's true for all technologies and how they might apply to learning, which is we, we tend, and I mean by we, I mean everyone, teachers, decision makers, venture capitalists, entrepreneurs, all kinds of people, we tend to face the technology as if it's the technology that's making a difference. I mean, I, you know, the, the laptop replaced the PCs, now everything will be different. Tablets replaced laptops, now everything will be different, right? Smartwatches, no, smartwatches didn't change anything. But yeah, you know, it, there was a sequence of these things. And now you see a lot of hysterical conversations about generative AI, it'll change everything, right? Well, the right way to do this is not to face the technology, but in a sense, face the biology, right? Look at learning. What do we know about learning and motivation? What would be better for learning and motivation than what is happening now to students, right? And then ask, is a better solution possible by drawing on technology, right? right? But the key is to start not from, ooh, cool, AI, but rather say, what would be better for learning? So an example is some of the things we just talked about, like, Gosh, it would be great if every student had a well-trained individualized tutor who would start a new hard skill by setting it in a context that the student loves and knows well, and then you get feedback connected to that context so that the student can really focus their first efforts on something that's in long-term memory and is easy, and then they build that skill set, which then later can be used for other things, right? Pity we can't afford to do that. Hmm, I wonder, is there any technology that might help us? To, yeah, that's is it. This is where you could now say, huh, generative AI, can we set it up to learn more about student interests and masteries and all this? Can we set it up to then provide, let's say, writing prompts or math problems you, that are going after the same principles for all students, but now using settings that are meaningful to them be able to give feedback on those at some level. I mean, it won't be perfect, but it's better than nothing. So students will rewrite. Well, so that's a use of AI 
that is caused by looking closely at the learning situation. And that's much more likely to be successful than something else. The other thing I'll say about generative AI, and I know we could go on for a long time about this one, but <clears throat> is, you know, we, we need to look at what will the world of work look like. Now, some of that is guesswork, right? Uh, who knows in five years? But you can bet journalists are not going to do a lot of writing of their own first drafts for fact-based things that are happening in the world. Opinion columnists plus minus, but even they might do some first drafting through generative AI. And so expert writers in the future of all kinds, lawyers, and right, they need to become good at managing George Santos as their assistant, who writes instantly well, sometimes wrong, but well, right? And so now, how do you train students to become really good editors of those kinds of work? Uh, great, that was nice, bro. My final question, I mean, it's been a fascinating discussion. If you were to look ahead, if you look in the future, how are you, are you hopeful? Are there lessons from learning engineering that you would uh, recommend? Do you see some of these uh, changes uh, that educators and others should be aware of? I think so. I mean, as I said, to me, the, the learning sciences work really suggests remarkable grounds for optimism, but also suggests real responsibility for all of us to get some things right. And I'm not sure we're doing it quite well yet, but there, the opportunity to do it well is there. So one of the areas I'd highlight is uh, getting the right learning outcomes. And I alluded to that a little bit before. But if you, if you look out there at the world of work, it used to be 30 or 40 years ago, you could get good at something in your early teens or, late, or early 20s, and then those skills would carry you through to retirement. You, know, you could use those skills for the next 40 years, whether it was in construction or medicine or I mean just high and low and sideways all different careers great you learn it early you execute it you're out it's terrific nowadays there's no way you can be a top performer without changing the mix of tools you use the way you approach your role and that means we've got to get much more systematic about understanding well what are top performers deciding and doing now and how do we connect that back to the training they're receiving in college, in workplace training, back, backwards into uh, you know, high school and so forth, along the lines we just talked about, but now across the whole range of work. So I think that's, that's one of the things that, that's just so important and the opportunity is there to do it. A second thing I think is really interesting is, so I'll say this dramatically, what is the point of a human being? Right? In, with generative AI getting better and better, what work will humans have left to do? So here there's a really interesting way to think about this, which is to think about the combinatorics of expertise generation. So it takes about, I mentioned the Anders Ericsson work, it takes roughly 10,000 hours of deliberate practice, so practice in a good, well-designed learning environment, to reach world-class performance in almost anything you want to do. Well, if you start when you're 15 or 20, and we're all living to be 90, okay, that means we have seven decades to use, right? So decade one is expertise one, decade two is expertise two, right? So let's imagine that I, you know, uh, I start out being interested in uh, being a gardener, okay? So I spend 10 years, I become a world-class gardener, if I have good practice and feedback environments, right? And then I start to think about, you know, I'd love to build a robot gardener. So then I spent 10 years learning robotics, developing a robot gardener, getting it ready to go, and now I, I got these two world-class expertise in my head that are clashing off each other and generate something. Great. Well, now I want to run a business of providing robot gardeners to the world. Okay, so now I go and become a business expert. I spent 10 years, I build that all up, right? And inevitably, because I'm creating robot gardeners, I'm probably gonna have accidents. I may need to build some legal competence. So I may need to add some legal competence, right? So we're talking like four of these things, right? So what's the value of the human being? The value is the crunching together of all these expertise inside one mind to generate new solutions, to make trade-offs, to do all that kind of stuff. So here's where it gets interesting, is if you think about the combinatorics of this, there's a hundred or a thousand different areas of expertise. 
So pick one of those thousand for your first one. Pick another one for your second, another for your third, another for your fourth, another for your fifth. You can actually have world-class five-factor expertise for every individual on the planet. Nice. So if you're wondering, what's, you know, how do we make sure humans are not made obsolete or whatever, this is one of the answers, is allow humans and help them get multiple sets of expertise that they then bring actually you know, to the world. And then the last thing I'll say, and this relates to our earlier stuff, which I think is just so exciting and is part of this 25 year story is, if we can get better and more systematic around these motivation issues of helping students as well as their teachers and parents see why they should start, persist, and put in mental effort and go after those four different things that go wrong the research that I talked about suggests we will actually allow students to reach dreams from levels of low competence as opposed to guiding them away from the dreams that they actually had. And many more people could therefore achieve one expertise, two expertise, three expertise, you know, etc., creating fulfilling lives at adding value um, based on that notion of understanding how to be motivated. So to me, that creates a, a bright future if we can step up to create the structures for that, understand the expertise, and then help teachers and students and parents dig into the motivation questions. Fascinating. I think sometimes when we make these progress, you know, we then take that progress for granted. But uh, everything we've talked about today kind of actually offers opportunities for us to really, if we work on it, like you said, offer educational opportunities to a large group of people and uh, a future that can be like brighter than anything that we've seen before. So on that positive note, thank you once again. A pleasure speaking and I'm sure that this is going to be a fascinating topic for many years to come. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate the time.